Testing is obviously crucial at every stage of the pandemic. But we have been very slow, and we're way behind other European countries. Now, the Health Secretary made a very important commitment to 100,000 tests a day by the end of April. But yesterday, the figure for actual tests was 18,000 a day, and that was down from Monday, which was 19,000 tests a day. So what does the First Secretary expect to happen in the next eight days to get us from 18,000 tests a day to 100,000 tests a day. But I do have to just correct him. Uh, our capacity for tests is now at 40,000 per day. So I think that is an incredibly important milestone. Uh, I didn't need correcting because I gave the, uh, the figure for the actual tests a day. The First Secretary says that there's capacity for 40,000 tests a day. And I think it's really important that we fully understand what the First Secretary just said. Because that means that the day before yesterday, 40,000 tests could have been carried out, but only 18,000 tests were actually carried out. Yep. Yep. Now, all week, I've heard from the front line, from care workers, who are frankly desperate for tests for their residents and for themselves, desperate. Yeah. I thought that was pretty good, right? I mean, it's, it, it wasn't a surprise to me that that was pretty good because, I mean, the thing Keir Starmer has going for him, his whole pitch was to say, look, I'm going to be okay at the dispatch box. I was a top QC. I'm the kind of guy who can, you know, ask questions which put people in a difficult situation. And I thought he kind of managed it there. So, you know, it, it made Dominic Raab, he sort of reeled Dominic Raab in to saying that, you know, what matters is that we've had 40,000 capacity. We've got all the, we've got the capacity for 40,000 tests. And Keir Starmer saying, well, like, no, I, I said you did 18,000 tests for a reason because that's what matters. What matters is how many tests you do, not how many tests you hypothetically have the capacity to do. And I thought, we, I thought it was quite effective at sort of showing that the Tories are, they, they keep trying to shift the goalposts and it's not particularly convincing. I'll go to you first, Aaron. What did you think? Pleasantly surprised? No, I, I agree with you. It was, it was really good. I mean, he's he, that's what he's good at. It's like saying that Jeremy Corbyn will be good at sort of going through, you know... Uh, a stump speech at Glastonbury. Yeah, or, you know, going to toll puddle in the summer and saying, you know, the trade union movement uh, is a really important thing in terms of changing society. We, we know what Keir Starmer's good at. Uh, the question is, is that is that sufficient to win a general election? I'm not going to deign to offer an answer now. Um... I think one thing with the reaction, you sort of had a lot of sort of blue tick centrists or anti-socialists, actually, that's the better word for them. Uh, a lot of them say, oh, wow, he's, you know, we finally got the leader we need, we deserve. What they need to understand is that parliamentary questions, PMQs, don't really matter to most people. You know, in my lifetime, there's probably been two or three moments in parliament PMQs where the public really sees what's going on. There's a kind of cut through. Maybe once there was one interaction between John Major and Tony Blair. Um, there was one interaction between David Cameron and, and Gordon Brown. You know, there was maybe one interaction between Cameron and 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 uh, Corbyn, where Cam Cameron monstered Corbyn. But gen and even then, but even then, that's like forty percent of the population kind of vaguely remembers seeing something to do with it they're not pinned to twitter or to facebook or to bbc parliament watching this stuff so it's great he's good at that it's great he's authoritative uh, but that in isolation it isn't going to win you an election and it's important to say most people don't think that you know it is just a select group of several dozen sort of times columnists and evening standard political diarists I'm going to go to I'm going to go to Lara in a moment, but first of all, I want to go through some of the tweets from commentators and MPs from yesterday because they, I mean, I don't I don't know if it was if it was that they all organically came to the same description for Keir Starmer's performance, but their their reviews definitely all looked quite samey. Julia Hartley Brewer, a very strong start from Keir Starmer at his first PMQs, all fair and reasonable, put with forensic accuracy. George Eaton, friend of the show. That was pretty forensic by Starmer. Uh, Christian Rednedge, already so forensic on detail. Liam Forp, he's from the Liverpool Echo. Starmer straight into it. Already looking pretty forensic, <laughs> Ian Martin. Good forensic first questions from Starmer. He's from Reaction, the right-wing side with this sort of odd name. Lewis Goodall. Again, I like Lewis Goodall. He's also gone for forensic. Paul Wall's gone for forensic. And now I think the next one we can look for is, is what all the MPs have said, which is also very similar. So now you can see all the different 
Labour MPs who've given exactly the same description of it. Yeah. Oh, there's all the pundits in there as well. Do you think, are you in an NEC WhatsApp group? Did anything go around to say, can you please tweet that Keir Starmer was very forensic at the dispatch box? Or do you <laughs> no. think it's just a coincidence? Oh, I don't know. The... I guess it's good that this kind of thing is going around. Like I saw people going, why is everyone complaining? Because people were saying things about Corbyn that were bad, like good things are going around now, just leave it. And I get it, but uh, I, I mean, I wasn't as impressed as 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 others of, of, of on his um, PMQ's um, thing, because I think Rab kind of fucked up in a bit. Um, oh, can I swear on this? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, he kind of messed up because he got into that trap you know so I, I think it was like okay exchange but um I don't know I, I agree with Aaron that not many people watch it so we've got to be aware of that um and how it how it fits into a wider um kind of political scene that we're creating um and I think uh, my highlight of PMQs under Jeremy Corbyn was him reading out name things in terms of people's stories um, and how poli politics and <clears throat> policies were affecting them and, you know, how he got angry about um, situations. And I really want to see that, like, passion and anger from Keir about injustice and what's going on. So, yeah, I think it was uh, OK, but I don't think it was, like, amazing and you know, forensic. And, you know, I think there's this kind of image that people have set for Keir as, like, this amazing lawyer. And, you know, may hopefully he uh, plays up to it. But I'd like to see some of that um, rather than just sort of the lawyer side, you know, the passion about that he says, you know, about doing the right thing, about justice, um, at the reason why he's explained that he went into law and stuff. Um, so hopefully we'll see that. But yeah, I don't think people watch PMQs and I don't think they will. Uh, it's fairly boring for people not involved with politics and they don't understand how it affects their daily lives or their po like political outlook around them. Uh, so yeah, I didn't think it was that amazing. <laughs> Was it too constructive for you? That's sort of like some of the conversation articles that this is Keir showing off what constructive opposition can look like. I mean, I was kind of annoyed because I feel like the the left critiques of Keir Starmer were portrayed as we want him to be more angry. Whereas my problem with Keir Starmer was I wanted him to ask genuinely difficult questions, which I what, the reason why I thought his PMQs there were quite good was because the questions he asked were hard and they were about the things that people care about. So yeah, there wasn't there wasn't that image of him standing up and saying, you know, like I'm the tribune of the people and I can speak in a sort of passionate, inspiring way. But he did get Dominic Raab to answer in an unconvincing way about testing. He got Dominic Raab to answer in an unconvincing way about uh, the deaths of, of care workers. And he got Dominic Raab to, in, to answer in a very unconvincing way about personal protective equipment, which was a massive improvement on the week earlier where he was saying, can you publish your exit strategy? And the Tories were incredibly comfortable because they were saying, no, we're not going to publish it because we're, we're in the middle of a lockdown. And most people listening to that were like, well, that sounds reasonable. It sounds like the Tories want to protect the NHS and the Labour Party are being a bit difficult. Whereas I, I feel like you couldn't portray him as, as that um, at yesterday so I thought that was a real yeah we've definitely improved from from last week but I think you know it's pretty low bar like I think the Tories are doing disastrously in this situation um and if we're able to, to call them out on their failures like they have been actually lying at some stages and I know you can't say that in the Houses of Parliament but um yeah so I think this is this is the bar where we should be at like here making um talking about um the mistakes that they're making so it shouldn't really be that hard to make them fall into traps because they're making the traps themselves in literally lying in their comms so i don't think that's a particularly hard thing to do um yeah it was bad last last week or whatever and we've moved forward from there from talking about the exit strategy which i just don't understand i literally have not heard an nhs staff member talk about that they've all been talking mm. about testing and ppe um so i'm glad that he's shifted his focus but yeah the, the bar we're now doing well instead of bad, but not amazing. <laughs> can, I, can I just say also, a lot of the people that really adore Starmer are obviously kind of like big Blair fans. Uh, and Blair excelled at PMQs when he was passionate. You know, Blair wasn't this forensic. Blair was a, like a bit of a populist. Uh, and this, this one was of, weak, weak, yeah, weak. Yeah, it? Was, yeah. Time. it was like he just went all, he just like absolutely went all in on John Major as a human being. It wasn't like, oh, and, then, and on page 52, he didn't do that. That's not what he was good at. That's what Gordon Brown was good at. And there's like, he and he's just been expunged. This kind of, this idea of Blair the populist has been expunged from the kind of centrist psyche. Um, and I'm not, that's not to say, maybe Starmer, can, I think personally, Starmer, looking the way he does, being very polite, and I think you said it before, Michael, I agree with it. It, it buys you permission, actually, to be more radical. Than you otherwise can be as a party potentially i buy the argument 
So the social movement behind Keir Starmer, the political party behind Keir Starmer, the trade unions behind Keir Starmer have permission to be that bit more radical if, if they if they play it cleverly, with, with that play it more intelligently, if they have that guy at the front. I, I, I buy that argument. I'm not going to say it's going to work, but it, it's a logical, consistent argument. But the, the idea that this was a continuation of sort of the successful sort of, you know, Blair, Blair kind of era of PMQs is just not accurate. Thank you.